Culture is the soul of a nation. The spiritual factors or culture are as important to mankind as the physical factors such as the races of the people and the land itself. Cultural developments define the history of a nation's civilization. The complete destruction of a national culture leads to the end of the nation. Ancient nations who had created glorious civilizations were considered to have vanished when their cultures disappeared, even though the people of their races may have still survived. When the French anthropologist Champollion painstakingly studied the Rosetta Stone from ancient Egypt, when archaeologists discovered the mud and clay writing tablets of ancient Babylonia, when people could only imagine the Halabi culture of ancient India from historical remains, when scientists were wondering about the scientific achievements that may have surpassed the ancients and amazed contemporaries in the Muse Museum, which was burnt down by Caesar's expeditionary forces, when scholars were studying the culture of the lost city of Atlantis, which Plato described in his dialogues, but is now buried at the bottom of the ocean, our thoughts turned to China. This land of China has created numerous magnificent splendors in philosophy, the arts, literature, and science. It is the only country in the world whose ancient civilization has been passed down continuously for over 5,000 years. The destruction of its traditional culture is more than a tragedy, it is an unforgivable crime. Eighty-five years ago, when the Chinese Communist Party was established, the crime began. The Communist Party has an intrinsic hostility towards Chinese traditional culture. It struggles against the Chinese culture with a life-and-death hysteria, insatiable anger, and violence. After the CCP came to power, its struggle against traditional culture became more sophisticated and systematic. Mao Zedong once said, fittingly, that he follows neither the Tao nor heaven. The Chinese culture, traditionally believed to be passed down by God, can be retold with the myths and legends of Chinese history. They include Pangu's creation of heaven and the earth, Nuwa's creation of humanity, Shenong's identification of hundreds of medicinal herbs, and Songji's invention of Chinese characters. The Taoist wisdom of unity of heaven and humanity has thus coursed through the veins of Chinese culture. Emperor Wang, who was thought of as the founder of Chinese culture, was also credited with founding Taoism. Confucius said, great learning promotes the cultivation of virtue. Confucius opened a school to teach students more than 2,000 years ago and imparted to society the Confucian ideals represented by the five cardinal virtues, benevolence, righteousness, propriety, wisdom, and faithfulness. In the first century AD, Buddha Shakyamuni's teachings traveled east to China with an emphasis on compassion and salvation of all beings. The Chinese culture became more wide-ranging and profound. Buddhism and Taoism 
established Chinese people's macroscopic understanding of the universe, life, and the human body. They are the part of Chinese culture that focused on leaving the mundane world. The influence of Buddhism and Taoism can be found to penetrate all aspects of people's lives. Chinese medicine, Qigong, Feng Shui, and divination are all rooted in Taoism. The well-known concepts of a heavenly kingdom and hell, the karmic rewards of good meeting with good and evil meeting with retribution, all of these came from Buddhism. Confucianism, on the other hand, is the part of traditional Chinese culture that focused on entering the mundane world. The profound influence of Taoism on Confucianism can be seen in such Confucian sayings as, aspire to the Tao, align with virtue, abide by benevolence, and immerse yourself in the arts. And, if one hears the Tao in the morning, one can die without regret in the evening. Confucianism emphasized family-based ethics, in which filial piety, or the concept of loyalty to one's parents and family, played an extremely important role, teaching that all kindness starts with filial piety. Confucius advocated benevolence, righteousness, propriety, wisdom, and faithfulness, but also said, aren't filial piety and brotherly love the roots of benevolence? Family-based ethics can be naturally extended to guide social morality. Filial piety can be extended to the people's loyalty to the monarch. Confucius said, It is seldom that a person with filial piety and brotherly love will be inclined to offend those above. Brotherly love is the relationship among brothers, and it can be further extended to righteousness and justice among friends. Confucians teach that in a family, a father should be kind, a son filial, an older brother friendly, and a younger brother respectful. Here, fatherly kindness can be further extended to benevolence of the monarch toward his subordinates. As long as the traditions of a family can be maintained, social morality can naturally be sustained. As it is said, cultivate oneself, regulate one's family, rightly govern one's state, and make the whole kingdom tranquil and happy. The beliefs of Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism offered the Chinese people a very stable moral system. This ethical system provided a basis for sustainability, peace, and harmony in society. Take the four Chinese classics, the four most renowned novels in Chinese culture, as examples. The Journey to the West is a mythical tale about cultivation practice. A Dream of Red Mansions explains the concept of predestined relationship through a tragic love story. The third book, Outlaws of the Marsh, opens with a tale of how an official accidentally set free 108 warrior spirits who ended up becoming bandits who pillaged and plundered from the corrupt in society. The fourth book, Three Kingdoms, begins with a heavenly warning of a disaster and ends with the inescapable conclusion that everything is God's will. It states, the world's affairs rush on like an endless stream, a heaven-told fate, infinite in reach, dooms all. The use of myths in these novels was not a coincidence, but a reflection of a basic philosophy of Chinese intellectuals toward nature and humanity. These novels have had a profound influence on the Chinese mind. When speaking of righteousness, people think of Guan Yu and of the Three Kingdoms, rather than the concept itself, how his righteousness to his friends transcended the clouds and reached heaven, how his unmovable loyalty to his superior and sworn brother, Liu Bei, gained him respect even from his enemies, how his bravery in battle prevailed in the most dire of situations, and in the end, as an ultimate result, he became a deity together with his son. When speaking of loyalty, Chinese people naturally think of Yue Fei, a Song Dynasty general who served his country with unreserved integrity and loyalty. They also think of Zhuge Liang, Prime Minister of the Shu State during the Three Kingdoms period, who gave his all until his heart stopped beating. 
traditional Chinese culture's eulogy of loyalty and righteousness has been fully elaborated in these authors' colorful stories. Taoism emphasizes truthfulness. Buddhism emphasizes compassion, and Confucianism values loyalty, tolerance, benevolence, and righteousness. While their forms differ, their purposes are the same. They all inspire people to return to kindness. These are the most valuable aspects of traditional Chinese culture, and they are based upon the beliefs of Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism. Many Chinese people may be illiterate, but they are familiar with these traditional plays and operas. Such cultural forms have been important ways for the people to learn traditional morals. In Chinese history, traditional culture reached its peak during the prosperous Tang Dynasty, coinciding with the height of the Chinese nation's power. Science was also advanced and enjoyed a unique reputation among all nations. Scholars from Europe, the Middle East, and Japan came to study in Chang'an, the capital of the Tang Dynasty. Countries bordering China took China as their suzerain state. Tens of thousands of countries came to pay tribute to China, even though they might have to be translated multiple times and clear successive customs. After the Qin Dynasty, China was often occupied by minority groups. This also happened during the Sui, Tang, Yuan, and Qing dynasties, and at other times when ethnic minorities established their own regimes. Nevertheless, almost all these ethnic groups were assimilated to the Chinese ways. This shows the great integrative power of Chinese traditional culture. As Confucius said, thus, if the people from afar are not compliant, bring them around by cultivating our culture and virtue. Then, the Communist Party came. It wanted struggle and attempted to eradicate from people's mind both the Tao and heaven that shadowed above it. Traditional culture respects the mandate of heaven. As Confucius once said, life and death are predestined, and wealth and rank are determined by heaven. Both Buddhism and Taoism are forms of theism that also believe in the reincarnation cycle of life and death, and the karmic causality of good and evil. The Communist Party, however, believes in atheism, in translating the Communist International Anthem, the CCP put it this way, There has never been a savior, and we do not rely on God either. To create human happiness, we rely entirely on ourselves. Confucianism values family, believing that all kindness starts with filial piety. The Communist Manifesto, however, clearly promulgates abolition of the family. Traditional culture differentiates the Chinese from the foreign, but the Communist Manifesto advocates the end of nationality. Confucian culture promotes kindness to others, but the Communist Party encourages class struggle. Confucians encourage loyalty to the monarch and love for the nation. However, the Communist Manifesto promotes the elimination of nations. Loyalty in traditional Chinese culture does not mean blind devotion. In the eyes of the people, although the emperor is a son of heaven, he still has heaven above him. The emperor cannot be correct at all times. The behavior of the emperor was judged by the Confucian classics. The dictatorial CCP could by no means accept traditional beliefs such as these. The CCP wanted to canonize its own leaders, and so would not allow such long-held concepts as heaven, Tao, and God to govern from above. The CCP was aware that what it did was considered the most heinous and enormous crime against heaven and the Tao, 
if measured by the standards of traditional culture. They were aware that as long as the traditional culture existed, people would not praise the CCP as great, glorious, and correct. Scholars would continue their tradition, risking their lives to admonish the monarch and maintaining justice even at the expense of their lives, and place the people above the rulers. Thus, the people would not become CCP puppets, and the CCP could not force conformity on the thoughts of the masses. The traditional culture's respect for heaven, the earth, and nature became an obstacle for the CCP's battle with nature in an effort to alter heaven and the earth. Traditional culture treasures human life, teaching that any situation involving human life has to be treated with the utmost care. Such a perception was a hindrance to the CCP's mass genocide and rule by terror. The traditional culture's ultimate moral standard of the heavenly Tao interfered with the CCP's manipulation of moral principles. The Communist Manifesto was not written with a purpose of opposing Chinese traditional culture. However, all of its beliefs completely oppose Chinese traditional culture. Thus, it is intrinsic and fundamental for the CCP to oppose Chinese culture. There is no way to compromise such contradiction. It was therefore inevitable for the CCP to eradicate traditional culture based upon its intrinsic nature of struggle. Since traditional culture is rooted in Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism, the CCP's first step in destroying traditional culture was to extinguish the manifestation of the divine principles in the human world, eradicating the three religions corresponding to them. Soon after the CCP established a government, it began to destroy temples, burn scriptures, and forced the Buddhist monks and nuns to return to secular life. Neither was it any softer in destroying other religious places. By the 1960s, there were hardly any religious places left in China. The Cultural Revolution brought even greater religious and cultural catastrophe in the campaign to cast away the four olds. Old ideas, old culture, old customs, and old habits. For example, the first Buddhist temple in China was the White Horse Temple, built in the early Eastern Han Dynasty outside Luoyang City in Henan Province. It is honored as the Cradle of Buddhism in China and also as the Founder's Home. During the campaign to cast away the Four Olds, the White Horse Temple, of course, could not escape looting. The following passage comes from the book how many cultural relics were committed to flames? The book says, There was a village near the temple. The party branch secretary led peasants to smash the temple in the name of revolution. The over 1,000-year-old clay statues of the 18 Arhats, built in the Liao dynasty, were destroyed. The Baiyu scripture that an eminent Indian monk brought to China 2,000 years ago was burned. A rare treasure, the Jade Horse, was smashed to pieces. Several years later, Cambodian king in exile, Norodom Sihanouk, made a special request to pay homage to the White Horse Temple. Zhou Enlai, the Chinese premier at the time, hurriedly ordered that the Beiyu scripture, stored in the imperial palace in Beijing, and that the statues of the 18 Arhats from the Temple of Azure Clouds from Shangshan Park near Beijing, all be transported immediately to the White Horse Temple. With these bogus replacements, a diplomatic difficulty was solved. The Cultural Revolution began in May 1966. It was, in fact, revolutionizing Chinese culture in a destructive way. Starting in August 1966, the raging fire of the campaign to cast away the Four Olds burned the entire land of China. Regarded as objects of feudalism, capitalism, and revisionism, the Buddhist temples, Taoist temples, Buddhist statues, historical and scenic sites, 
calligraphy, paintings, and antiques became the main targets for destruction by the Red Guards. Take the Buddha statues, for example. There are 1,000 colored, glazed Buddha statues in relief on the top of Longevity Hill at the Summer Palace in Beijing. After the campaign to cast away the Four Olds, they were all damaged. None of them has a complete set of the five sensory organs any longer. The capital of the country was like this, and so was the rest of the country. The Luoguan Temple, where Lao Tzu gave his lecture and left his famous Tao Te Ching 2,500 years ago, is situated in the Zhoujiu County of Shanxi Province. Centered on the platform where Lao Tzu lectured, within a radius of three miles, there are over 50 historical sites. The Luoguan Temple, and the other historical sites have now been destroyed and all the Taoist priests have been forced to leave. According to the Taoist canon, once one becomes a Taoist priest, one can never shave one's beard or have one's hair cut. However, Taoist priests are now forced to have haircuts, to take off their Taoist robes and to become members of people's communes. Some of them married daughters of the local peasants and became their sons-in-law. At the sacred Taoist places in Laoshan Mountain in Shandong Province, the Temple of Supreme Peace, the Temple of the Highest Clarity, the Supreme Clarity Temple, the Dou Mu Temple, the Huayan Convent, the Ningzhen Temple, the Temple of Guan Yu, the statues of the divine sacrificial vessels, scrolls of Buddhist sutras, cultural relics, and temple tablets were all smashed and burned down. In the campaign to cast away the Four Olds, many one-of-a-kind books, calligraphies, and paintings that had been collected by intellectuals were committed to fire. Zhang Bojun had a family collection of over 10,000 books. The Red Guard leaders used them to make a fire to warm themselves. What was left was sent to paper mills and shredded to paper pulp. A poem by Meng Haran from the Tang Dynasty goes, While worldly matters come and go, ancient, modern, to and fro, rivers and mountains are changeless in their glory and still to be witnessed from this trail. If today Chinese people were still to remember some of their history, they would probably feel differently when they recite this poem. Cultural relics as the essence of Chinese culture, have been inherited and accumulated over several thousand years. Once destroyed, they cannot be restored. Experiences like that of Zhang Bojun are countless all over China. Rarely any relics and historic sites could escape such catastrophe. When we sighed over the old summer palace being burned down by the Anglo-French Allied force, when we sighed over the monumental work of the Yongle Encyclopedia being destroyed by invaders' flames of war, how could we have anticipated that the destruction caused by the CCP would be so much more widespread, so much more long-lasting, and so much more thorough than that caused by any invaders? In the Mahayana Mahaparina Nirvana Sutra, said to be the last of Buddha Shakyamuni's Mahayana Sutras, he predicted that after his Nirvana, demons would be reincarnated as monks and male and female lay Buddhists to subvert the Dharma. Of course, we cannot verify what Buddha Shakyamuni was referring to exactly. However, the CCP's destruction of Buddhism indeed started with forming a united front with some Buddhists. 
They even sent some underground Communist Party members to infiltrate the religion directly, to subvert it from within. In a criticism meeting during the Cultural Revolution, someone questioned Zhao Puchu, vice president of the Chinese Buddhist Association at the time. You are a Communist Party member, so why do you believe in Buddhism? Buddha Shakyamuni received righteous attainment through precept, concentration, wisdom. Before his nirvana, he instructed his disciples to admire the precepts, regard the precepts as your teacher. In the Buddhist scriptures, many kinds of retribution were described for breaking the precepts. In 1952, the CCP sent representatives to attend the inaugural meeting of the Chinese Buddhist Association. At the meeting, Many Buddhists in the association proposed to abolish the Buddhist precepts. They claimed that these disciplines had caused the death of many young men and women. Some people even advocated, people should be free to believe in any religion. There should also be freedom for the monks and nuns to get married, to drink alcohol, and to eat meat. Nobody should interfere with these. At that time, Master Shu Yun was at the meeting and saw that Buddhism was facing the danger of extinction in China. He stepped forward opposing the proposals and appealed for the preservation of the Buddhist precepts and dress. Master Shu Yun was then slandered and labeled as counter-revolutionary. He was detained in the abbot's room and denied food and drink. He was not allowed out of the room even to use the toilet. He was also ordered to hand over his gold, silver, and firearms. When Shu Yun answered that he had none, he was beaten so badly that his skull was fractured and bleeding, and his ribs broken. Shu Yun was 112 years old at the time. The military police pushed him from the bed to the ground. When they came back the next day and found Shu Yun still alive, they brutally beat him again. The so-called Chinese Buddhist Association was founded in 1952. The Chinese Taoist Association was founded in 1957. Both clearly declared in their founding statements that they would be under the leadership of the people's government. In reality, they would be under the leadership of the atheist CCP. Both associations indicated that their members would actively participate in daily work activities and implement government policies. They were transformed into completely secular organizations. Religions are a way for people to remove themselves from the secular world and cultivate themselves. They emphasize the other shore, the shore of perfect enlightenment and the concept of heaven. The political monks and pastors who had formed united fronts with the CCP made up a series of lies and slogans such as human world Buddhism and religion is the truth and so is socialism. They claimed there is no contradiction between this shore and the other shore. They encouraged Buddhists and Taoists to pursue happiness, glory, splendor, wealth, and rank in this life and changed the religious doctrines and their meanings. Buddhism forbids killing. Yet the CCP killed people like flies during the suppression of counter-revolutionaries in the early 1950s. In response, the political monks cooked up the absurd justification that killing the counter-revolutionaries is even greater compassion. During the Korean War, which the CCP called the War to Resist U.S. Aggression and Aid Korea, monks were even sent directly to the front line to kill. Take Christianity as another example. In 1950, party loyal Wu Yaozong formed what was called the Three Self Church. It followed the principles of self-administration, self-support, and self-propagation. He claimed that they would break away from imperialism and join the war to resist U.S. aggression and aid Korea. A good friend of his was imprisoned for over 20 years for refusing to join his three-self church and suffered all kinds of torture and humiliation. 
When he asked Wu Yaozong, how do you regard the miracles Jesus performed? Wu answered, I have thrown them all out. Not acknowledging Jesus' miracles equates to not acknowledging Jesus' heaven. How can one be counted as a Christian when one does not even recognize the heaven Jesus ascended to? However, Wu Yaozong became the founder of China's official version of Christianity and a member of the Political Consultative Conference Standing Committee. When he stepped into the Great Hall of the People, he must have completely forgotten Jesus' words from the book of Matthew, Thou shalt love thy Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The CCP confiscated temple property, forced monks and nuns to study Marxism and Leninism, brainwashed them, and even forced them to hard labor. What is even more absurd is that the CCP encouraged monks and nuns to get married so as to disintegrate Buddhism. For example, just before the March 8 Women's Day in 1951, the Women's Federation in Changsha City, Hunan Province, ordered all nuns in the province to make up their minds to get married in just a few days. In addition, young and healthy monks were forced to join the army and were sent to the battlefield to serve as cannon fodder. Various religious groups in China have disintegrated under the CCP's violent suppression. The genuine elites of Buddhism and Taoism have been suppressed. Among the remaining monks and Taoists, Many returned to secular life, and many others were undisclosed Communist Party members who specialized in putting on monk's robes, Taoist robes, or a pastor's long gown to distort the Buddhist scriptures, the Taoist canon, and the Holy Bible, and to look for justification for the CCP's political movements in these doctrines. The last step in destructing a belief and culture is to insult it so that people despise it from then on, preventing it from ever being restored. The CCP considered the traditions of the Hui Muslim group to be one of the four olds, old thought, culture, tradition, and habit. Therefore, it forced the Hui people to eat pork. Muslim peasants and mosques were required to raise pigs and each household had to furnish two pigs to the country every year. The Red Guards even forced the second highest living Tibetan Buddha, the Panchen Lama, to eat human excrement. They ordered three monks from the Temple of Bliss, located in Harbin City, Heilongjiang Province, which is the biggest Buddhist temple built in modern times, to hold a poster board that said, The hell with sutras, they are full of shit. In 1971, the CCP started a frantic movement to criticize Confucius, an author who wrote under the pen name Liang Xiao, published an article in The Red Flag, the CCP's foremost magazine, entitled, Who is Confucius? The article described Confucius as a madman who wanted to turn history backward and a deceptive and shrewd demagogue. A series of cartoons and songs followed demonizing Confucius. In this way, the dignity and sacredness of religion and culture were annihilated. The characters of the written Chinese language embody the essence of 5,000 years of civilization. Each character's form and pronunciation and the idioms and literary allusions composed of combinations of the characters express profound cultural meanings. The CCP has not only simplified the Chinese characters, but also tried to replace them with Romanized pinyin, which would remove all cultural tradition from the Chinese characters and language. But the replacement plan failed, thus sparing further damage to the Chinese language. However, the intellectuals who inherited the same traditional culture 
were not so fortunate as to be spared destruction. Before the CCP gained power in 1949, China had about two million intellectuals. Although some had studied in Western countries, they still inherited some Confucian ideas. The CCP certainly could not relax its control of them because, as members of the traditional scholar aristocracy class, their ways of thinking played important roles in shaping the thoughts of ordinary people. In September 1951, the CCP initiated a broad thought reform movement, starting in Beijing University among the intellectuals. The intellectuals were required to organize a movement to confess their history, including their thoughts, faithfully and honestly, in attempts to cleanse any counter-revolutionary elements. Mao Zedong never liked intellectuals. He said that they ought to be aware of the truth that actually many so-called intellectuals are, relatively speaking, quite ignorant, and that the workers and farmers sometimes know more than they do. Mao also said, compared with the workers and peasants, to the CCP, the intellectuals are dirty, and in the last analysis, the workers and peasants are the cleanest people, even though their hands are covered with dirt and their feet are smeared with cow dung. The CCP's persecution of intellectuals started with various forms of accusations, ranging from the 1951 criticism of Wu Shun, or running schools with begged money, to Mao Zedong's personal attack in 1955 on writer Hu Feng, a scholar and literary critic, as a counter-revolutionary. In the beginning, the intellectuals were not categorized as a reactionary class, but by 1957, after several major religious groups had surrendered through the Unified Front Movement, the CCP could focus its energy on the intellectuals now. The anti-rightist movement then was launched. At the end of February 1957, claiming to let a hundred flowers bloom and a hundred schools of thought contend, the CCP called on intellectuals to voice their suggestions and criticisms of the party, promising no retaliation. These intellectuals had been dissatisfied with the CCP for a long time for its ruling in every field, even though it was a layman in those fields, and its killing of innocent people during the movement to suppress counter-revolutionaries in 1950 to 1953, and the movement to eliminate counter-revolutionaries in 1955 to 1957. They thought that the CCP had finally become open-minded, so they began to speak their true feelings, and their criticism grew more and more intense. Many years later, there are still many people who believe that Mao Zedong only started to attack the intellectuals after becoming impatient with their overly harsh criticisms. The truth, however, turned out to be different. On May 15, 1957, Mao Zedong wrote an article entitled, Things Are Beginning to Change, and circulated it among senior CCP officials. The article said, In recent days, the rightists have shown themselves to be most determined and most rabid. The rightists, who are anti-communist, are making a desperate attempt to stir up a typhoon above Force 7 in China, and are so bent on destroying the Communist Party. After that, the officials who had been indifferent to the Let a Hundred Flowers Bloom and a Hundred Schools of Thought Contend campaign suddenly became enthusiastic and earnest. In her memoir, The Past Doesn't Disappear Like Smoke, Zhang Bojun's daughter recounted the following. Li Weihan, minister of the United Front Work Department, called Zhang Bojun in person to invite him to a so-called rectification meeting to offer his opinion about the CCP. Zhang was arranged to sit on a front row sofa. Not knowing this to be a trap, Zhang articulated his criticisms of the CCP. During the whole course, Li Weihan appeared relaxed. Zhang probably thought Li agreed with what he said. What he didn't know was that Li was pleased because he saw his prey falling into the trap. After the meeting, Zhang was classified as the number one rightist in China. We can cite a string of dates 
that marked proposals or speeches delivered by intellectuals offering criticism and suggestions. Zhang Bojun's Political Design Institute on May 21st, Long Yun's Absurd Anti-Soviet Views on May 22nd, Luo Longji's Redressing Committee on May 22nd, Lin Shiling's speech on criticizing the CCP's feudalistic socialism at Beijing University on May 30th, Wu Zhuguang's The Party Should Stop Leading the Arts on May 31st, and Chu Anping's The Party Dominates the World on June 1st. All these proposals and speeches had been invited and were offered after Mao Zedong had already sharpened his butcher's knife. All of these intellectuals, predictably, were later labeled rightists. There were more than 550,000 of them nationwide. Chinese tradition has it that scholars can be killed but cannot be humiliated. The CCP, however, was capable of humiliating intellectuals, depriving their right to make a living and even incriminating their families unless they accepted humiliation. Many intellectuals did surrender. During the course, some of them turned in others to save themselves, which broke many people's hearts. Those who did not submit to humiliation were killed, serving as examples to terrorize the others. Thus, the intellectuals, the traditional scholarly class, the exemplars of social morality, were obliterated. Mao Zedong said, What can Emperor Qin Shi Huang brag about? He only killed 460 Confucian scholars, but we killed 46,000 intellectuals. In our suppression of counter-revolutionaries, didn't we kill some counter-revolutionary intellectuals as well? I argued with the pro-democratic people who accused us of acting like Emperor Qin Shi Huang. I said they were wrong. We surpassed him by a hundred times. Indeed, Mao did more than kill the intellectuals. Even worse, he destroyed their minds and hearts. While the CCP was destroying the traditional semi-divine culture of China, it quietly established its own party culture through continuous political movements. As one of the CCP's classic documents, Mao's speech at the Yan'an Forum on Literature and the Arts named cultural endeavors and the military as the two battlefronts. It stated that it was not enough to have just the armed military, an army of literary arts was also needed. It stipulated that the literary arts should serve politics, and the literary arts of the proletariat class are the gears and screws of the revolutionary machine. A complete system of party culture was developed out of this, with supporting the CCP the ultimate goal, and with atheism and class struggle at the core. This system goes completely against traditional culture, and penetrates every aspect of people's life. It formed an environment of terror and despotism for the party, so that the possessing evil specter could control people even more tightly. One of the important roles of the party culture is to eulogize the CCP dictatorship and its values of atheism and class struggle. People who experienced the Cultural Revolution might still remember vividly the model play of modern operas, the songs with Mao's words and lyrics, and the loyalty dance. Many still recall the words from the dialogues from the propaganda films, Tunnel Warfare, War of the Mines, and Taking Tiger Mountain by Strategy. 
Such literary works of party culture have had a profound influence on the Chinese people. When speaking of exploitation, people naturally think of Zhou Bapi, a figure from a novel who faked the crow of a rooster to wake up his hired hands to work at midnight. When speaking of the term local bully, people naturally think of Hu Han San, a fake figure who was portrayed as a merciless bully. Mother of Wang Shuren has become synonymous with cruelty. Old society is a synonym for misery, and only the new society, which implies the one under the rule of the CCP, could enjoy a so-called bright day. In fact, the CCP has gradually brainwashed people through literature, plays, and film, comparing the sweet life under the CCP rule to the miserable life in the past. It fills their minds with messages such as how brilliant and great the party is, how arduously and valiantly the party has struggled against the enemy, how utterly devoted to the party its soldiers are, how willing they are to sacrifice themselves for the party, and how stupid and vicious its enemies are. Day after day, the CCP propaganda machine injects the beliefs needed by the Communist Party into every Chinese citizen. Today, if one went back to watch the epic poem of musical dance, The East is Red, one would realize that the entire theme and style of the show is about killing, killing, and more killing. One step beyond the truth is fallacy. The CCP party culture also abuses traditional morality to a certain extent. For instance, traditional culture values faith, and so does the Communist Party. However, what the party promotes is faithfulness and honesty to the party. Traditional culture emphasizes filial piety. The CCP may put people in jail if they do not provide for their parents. However, it is not because they violated the traditional responsibilities of filial piety, but because the parents would otherwise become a burden to the government and party. When it fits the party's needs, children are required to draw clear boundaries separating themselves from their parents. Traditional culture stresses loyalty and follows the precept that people are of supreme importance, the nation comes next, and last comes the ruler. However, the loyalty preferred by the CCP is blind devotion, so completely blind that people are required to believe in the CCP unconditionally and obey it unquestioningly. In traditional culture, music is taken as a way to constrain human desires. In the Book of Music, Volume 24 of the Records of the Historian, Sima Chan said, The nature of man is peaceful. The sensation of external matters affects one's emotions and stirs up the sentiment of love or hate based upon one's character and wisdom. If these sentiments are not constrained, one will be seduced by endless external temptations and assimilated by one's internal sentiments to commit many bad deeds. Thus, said Sima Qian, the emperors of the past used rituals and music to constrain people. The songs should be cheerful but not obscene, sad but not overly distressing. They should express feelings and desires, yet have control over these sentiments. Confucius said in the Analects, the 300 verses of the Odes may be summed up in a single sentence, think no evil. Such a beautiful thing as music, however, was used by the CCP as a method to brainwash the people. Songs like, Socialism is Good, and There Would Be No New China Without the Communist Party, and many others, have been sung from kindergarten to university. In singing these songs, people have unconsciously accepted the meanings of the lyrics. Further, the CCP stole the tunes of the most melodious folk songs and replaced them with lyrics that praise the party. 
This has served both to destroy traditional culture and to promote the party. The history commonly told by the CCP is very misleading. It not only promotes the CCP, but also distorts history. For example, the CCP called the civil war that overthrew the nationalist government the Liberation War. It referred to the post-1949 period as the period following the founding of the nation, when in reality, China existed long before that. The CCP simply established a new political regime. The three-year-long Great Famine was called Three Years of Natural Disaster, when in fact it was not at all a natural disaster, but rather a completely man-made calamity. However, upon hearing these words used in everyday life and being imperceptibly influenced by them, people unconsciously accepted the ideologies that the CCP intended to instill in them. The CCP also abused religious vocabulary and distorted the meanings of those terms. For instance, enlightenment in religion refers to a cultivator's enlightenment to the true meaning of life and to return to his true self. However, the CCP changed it to mean the extent of understanding of the party and its rules and policies. At the same time, the CCP has created its own system of speech and discourse. Party conferences have always begun successfully and ended satisfactorily. Meetings with foreign officials are always conducted in a so-called cordial and friendly atmosphere. Party resolutions are always firmly supported and thereafter are followed and implemented by the people. The use of the abusive language in mass criticism, flattering words to sing the praises of the party, and the banal official formalities such as those contained in the party's eight-part essay, lead people to speak unconsciously with thinking patterns that promote the concept of class struggle and extol the party. The mechanism of the party's domination is similar to a hydraulic system, relying on high pressure and isolation to maintain its state of control. Even one tiny leak could cause the system to collapse. So, despotism and dictatorship are the nature of the party culture, serving its goal of political and class struggle and subtly influencing people's internal psyche and external behavior. Since people have no freedom of thought, speech, association or belief, and are forced to be consistent with the party's central committee, the culture of the Communist Party is that of a monopoly. For the past 55 years, the CCP has been using terror to suppress the minds of Chinese people. Wielding their whips and butcher's knives to force people to conform, people never know when unforeseen disasters will befall them. Living in fear, the people became obedient. The CCP control of society is all-encompassing. There is a household registration system, a neighborhood residence committee system, and various levels of party committee structure. Party branches are established at even the grassroots level. Each and every single village, for instance, has its own party branch. The CCP completely neglected the principles of rule by law in modern society and vigorously promoted the policy of implication. It used its absolute power to punish relatives of those who were labeled as landlords, rich, reactionaries, bad elements, and rightists. It proposed the class origin theory that one's nature was determined by the class into which one was born. Today, 
if a Falun Gong practitioner appeals, his family members, his fellow employees, and leaders of the company where he works, and even leaders in the province and city where he resides, are implicated. The CCP also issued various discriminatory policies, whereby even children were singled out as being potentially re-educated and transformed, while their parents might have been classified as among the five black classes. The party promoted placing righteousness above family loyalty and turning one's weapon around to strike against one's own side in order to comply with the party. Systems such as the personnel and organizational archive system and the temporary relocation system were established to ensure the implementation of the party's policies people were encouraged to accuse and expose others and rewarded for contributions to the party. In addition, the party culture with respect to propaganda includes many forms, such as the culture of one voice. This requires all media to join together to sing the praises and collectively speak in support of the party on major issues. When needed, Leaders from every level of the party, government, military, workers, youth leagues, and women's organizations, are brought out to express their support. Everyone has to go through the ordeal. Other forms include a culture to promote violence, a culture to incite hatred, a culture of deception and lies, a culture of brainwashing, a culture of adulation, a culture of pretentiousness, and a culture that confounds right and wrong. This way, the CCP established a culture that transforms human beings into machines. The party wants the people to be the never rusting bolts in the revolutionary machine, to be tamed as the tools of the party. The people also formed a culture of self-imposed brainwashing and unconditional obedience. These were reinforced by slogans such as fight ruthlessly to eradicate any selfish thoughts that flashed through your mind and erupt a revolution in the depths of your soul. Another, maintain maximum alignment with the party's central committee. Unify the minds, unify the footsteps, unify the orders, and unify the commands. The evil factors of human nature such as selfishness, jealousy, harming others, or even adding insult to injury were further amplified by the party. There are many more examples like these. Everyone from mainland China can find various elements of party culture in his own personal experience. The CCP thus formed a social and cultural environment suitable for the survival of its possessing evil specter. After the CCP adopted the policy of economic reform and opening up, it renovated many churches as well as Buddhist and Taoist temples. It organized temple fairs, built up various folk customs, and established national cultural villages in China. It also organized major cultural fairs and exhibitions of archaeological relics overseas. Many kinds of local opera, folk arts and crafts, as well as Chinese paintings, calligraphy, and cuisine, seemed to be extensively promoted and developed. They appeared to be glorious and vied with each other for glamour. However, this was actually the last effort of the CCP to utilize and destroy the remaining traditional culture. The party culture merely changed its appearance, but not its essence. Chinese culture has a divine meaning in it. For instance, the science in ancient China directly studied things like the human body, life, and the universe. Take Chinese medicine as an example. As documented in medical texts, most of the great physicians had supernatural abilities. 
When Dr. Bian Chi met Tsai Huang Gong, he knew what illness he had just by looking at his complexion. When Dr. Hua Tua met Emperor Cao Cao, he knew right away that Cao Cao had a tumor in his brain. Yet these things, the essence, are often denounced these days and are now said to be blind beliefs or superstition. What Chinese medicine has inherited today are only prescriptions or experiences gained from trial and error. Chinese medical physicians have to learn Western medicine in their classes on fundamentals. Diagnosis and treatment depend on measuring blood pressure and taking x-rays, not on the traditional means. The essence of culture is its inner moral meaning, while the superficial forms have only entertainment value. However, the CCP exaggerates the superficial elements of culture, which entertain, to cover up its purpose of destroying morality. The more terracotta soldiers and horses exhibitions, the more calligraphy and painting exhibitions, and the more antique exhibitions that the CCP organizes, the more cultural festivals, arts festivals, or food festivals that the CCP hosts, the more deceptive the CCP is, it leads people astray from understanding true traditional culture. The party culture of the CCP has indeed done well in helping the CCP to win power and control over society. Like its army, prisons, and police force, the party culture is also a machine of violence, which provides a different kind of brutality, cultural brutality. This cultural brutality, by destroying 5,000 years of traditional culture, has diminished the will of the people and undermined the cohesiveness of the Chinese nationality. At the same time, the destruction of the traditional culture has brought unexpected physical damage. Traditional culture values the unity of heaven and humanity and the harmonious coexistence between man and nature. The CCP has declared endless joy from fighting with heaven and earth. This culture of the CCP led directly to the serious degradation of the natural environment that plagues China today. The Chinese people, having abandoned the traditional value that a nobleman treasures wealth, but he makes his fortune in a decent way, have wantonly ravaged and polluted the natural environment. Currently, more than 75% of the 30,000 miles of China's rivers are unsuitable as a habitat for fish. Over one-third of the groundwater was polluted even a decade ago, and the situation continues to worsen today. A spectacle of a strange kind occurred in the Huaihe River. A little child playing in the oil-filled river created a spark that upon striking the surface of the river lit a flame almost 20 feet high. As the fire surged into the air, more than 10 willow trees in the vicinity were burnt to a crisp. One can easily see that it is impossible for those who drink such water not to develop cancer or other strange diseases. Other environmental problems, such as desertification and salinization in northwest China, and industrial pollution in developed regions, are all related to society's loss of respect for nature. Traditional culture respects life. The CCP urges that revolt is justifiable and that struggle with human beings is full of joy. In the name of revolution, the party could murder and starve to death tens of millions of people. This has led people to devalue life, which then encourages the proliferation of fake and poisonous products in the marketplace. In Fuyang City of Anhui Province, for example, many healthy babies developed short limbs, thin and weak bodies, and enlarged heads during their lactation period. The disease was caused by poisonous milk powder made by black-hearted and greedy manufacturers. For food, some people feed crabs, snakes, and turtles with hormones and antibiotics. They mix industrial alcohol with drinking wine. They polish rice using industrial oil and whiten bread flour with industrial brightening agents. For eight years, a manufacturer in Hunan province 
produced thousands of tons of cooking oil every month using materials containing carcinogens, such as waste oil, oil extracted from leftover meals, or industrial byproducts that contained residual oils. Producing poisonous foods is not a local or limited phenomenon, but is common all over China. This has everything to do with the single-minded pursuit of material gain that comes in the wake of the destruction of culture and the consequent degeneration of human morality. Unlike the absolute monopoly and exclusivity of the party culture, the traditional culture has a tremendous integrative capacity. During the prosperous Tang Dynasty, Buddhist teachings, Christianity, and other Western religions coexisted harmoniously with Taoist and Confucian thought. Authentic Chinese traditional culture would have kept an open and tolerant attitude toward modern Western civilization. What are known as the Four Tigers of Asia, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, and Hong Kong, have created a new Confucian cultural identity. Their soaring economies have proven that traditional culture is not a hindrance to social development. At the same time, authentic traditional culture measures the quality of human life on the basis of happiness from within rather than material comfort from without. A famous poet in China's history, Han Yu, said, I would rather have no one blame me behind my back than have someone praise me to my face. I would rather have peace in mind than have comfort in body. Dao Yuanming, another great poet, lived in poverty, but he kept a joyful spirit and, in his own words, enjoyed picking asters beneath the eastern fence and gazing upon the southern mountain in the distance. Culture offers no answers for questions such as how to expand industrial production or what social systems to adopt. Rather, it plays an important role in providing moral guidance and restraint. The true restoration of traditional culture will require the recovery of humility toward heaven and toward the earth and nature, of respect for life and awe before God. It will allow humanity to live harmoniously with heaven and earth and to enjoy a heaven-given old age. <laughs>